Well, good morning, everybody, and good morning, Tamson. Delighted to have you here. Our guest today is Dr. Tamson Willie Barker, author of Teaming, How Nature's uh, Oldest Teams uh, Adapt and Thrive. Did I get the title right? Um, Tamson, we usually start by asking uh, our interviewee to introduce yourself rather than us reading off your bio. Tell us something important for us to know about you. It can be just for today or it can be whatever you want. So. I'm an evolutionary biologist by training. So I worked with uh, baboons in Ethiopia. I lived in a tent by the side of the river and um, a population geneticist. So I was studying the way that these baboons organize their social lives. And it turns out that that changes the rate of change, the rate of their ability to adapt, but also their uh, a degree of collaboration. So I took those principles that I found in the field and applied them to companies and organizations and all the things that we try to do. And the, you know, we can't get things done it's because we're not designed for it. Fantastic. That's a, a great lead in. Um, I will start to ask you more in-depth questions about that in a minute, but let's, we'd like to start with, um, we chose 2045 because it's far enough out on the time horizon where we can kind of get past the immediate uh, swarm of, of things that look really challenging. What do you see as positive trends that in another 23 years might lead us to being in a pretty good place? What's your vision of how the world might look then? Well, I, right now I'm reading uh, Utopian Legacies, John C. Mohawk. And um, so we're looking really good right now compared to the Inquisition. So I feel the trend is just heading right up there. Um, <laughs> Inquisition seems like a low bar. <laughs> yeah, the low bar. Um, but I try to be really positive. I am really positive because the way I see it is, um, you know, this is a, a long-term project and it's it, we keep doing our best. Everybody shows up and does their best and somehow the system um, will bat into the goal, I believe. <laughs> Great. But we're designed to adapt and thrive. So I believe we can. I love that. I, I, I need that. I, let's talk about superorganisms. This is something you mentioned a lot in your book. What is a superorganism? Right. Well, we have this idea, you know, well, we're just smarter chimpanzees, right? But if you really look at our social uh, societies, um, we're organized more like ants and honeybees, like we're a super organism species. And what that means is that, um, you know, you, you depend on everybody fundamentally to survive. Uh, so we're not, you know, we're going around feeling like we're less than and we're inadequate. You are. <laughs> You're not supposed to do it all by yourself. Uh, so that's what a superorganism is. And you can see like ants and honeybees, they share a purpose and nobody tells them what to do and they're going out and, and doing these things. And, and that's, that's the basic pattern that applies to us as well. So I like to look at those deep patterns and compare them to our lives and look for the deficits and you know pot reveal potential that we haven't um, really been aware of. Mm -hmm. In your book, you point out a number of patterns and principles um, that superorganisms share. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So they have a really kind of this deep pattern where they are, um, you know, they share a purpose, but there's lots of individuals and they're diverse and autonomous. So they're going out and they're collecting little particles of resources and they're sharing them. So they share the work and the wealth. Um, and then they use this collective intelligence so that nobody's telling them what to do. They're just uh, sharing their diverse autonomous uh, sense and response to yield this, you know, intelligence that's emergent. Um, and they all have different roles and different jobs, but they are all dependent. I mean, they all require each other. And so in that process of bringing all those particles together, they partner with other organisms. So symbiosis, and they upcycle those uh, particles. And so that creates this abundance, like they are sitting on great uh, bonanzas. But what happens, of course, is parasites are attracted to that and different kinds of species are attracted to that bonanza. So they break it down and return it to the territory. So territories get richer and richer and that's the deep superorganism pattern. And you see it in ants and honeybees and termites um, and even in creatures like uh, mycelial fungus. Um, so it's a deep pattern. Beginning of your book, you pose a fantastic question of how do you compound infinite wealth on a finite planet? And I posed that to a friend of mine and he started immediately talking about money. I said, no, we're not talking about money here. That's, you're confusing money with wealth, but tell us a little bit about how does nature compound infinite wealth on a finite planet? Right, well, so 
species are, I mean, individuals are always trying to invest in their future offspring is really what they're trying to do. But, you know, and that's like the selfish gene that we, you know, know about. But in reality, if you track that mathematically, of course, it leads to everyone investing in everyone else. So you, life does create conditions conducive to more life in that way. Um, so that, that's what I mean. And then if you look at the superorganisms, you know, they are growing infinite wealth. It's really density. It's density of trust and density of exchange. And so what they get is this kind of fresh on demand kind of paradise almost of like where, when they need it, they get, get it. They have it up fresh on demand. And that's kind of uh, this Edenic, you know, s situation that we, we can think about. So where did humans fall off the, the rails here? It seems like we have somewhere between 3.8 and 4.2 billion years of life behind us here on this planet. And it's been a, per you know, when I think of it, like, wow, when life emerged on this planet, it was a ball of molten lava surrounded by a toxic cloud. And now we have, I wouldn't say paradise, but pretty close to paradise, you know, it's, it's this abundance, this fecundity of life you know, everywhere. And yet in the last couple hundred years, we seem to have fallen away from the natural expression of that intelligence into some kind of, you know, backwater where we're, we're rapidly dismantling our life support systems. Do you have any ideas on, on what happened there? Yeah, I mean, so superorganisms are, you know, they share a purpose, they kind of emerge from place, and they have a boundary. Um, of course, we've just become this global blob. And so if you look at, you know, um, you know, if you use like game theory, you can see that that cheater strategies uh, oscillate with earnest, honest ones. And so you get this fluctuation. So I think that, you know, in, in if you look at indigenous societies, they're super um, careful not to allow any kind of uh, um, narcissism or domination to emerge. And they, they work collectively to suppress that. But, you know, as soon as you uh, lose that, that place sourced um, essence, that shared purpose, you become vulnerable to parasites. Super organisms always are. So I think we've been parasitized, and then it once you once it starts, it's very hard to to stop. It's a runaway system. But you know, if you look at oscillating cycles, it's typically like fifteen to eighty five percent. And so you know, like I would think we're like hitting that upper boundary. So I think it's all going to dissolve into wondrous superorganisms again, because you can't fight nature. It, it sounds like. Um what we need is not a fix, but an immune response. What would an uh -huh. immune response look like? You know, how can we look at our current uh, predicament and all these dilemmas and say, rather than trying fixing something here, how could we create the conditions for an immune response for humanity to move back into superorganism status, to, to recover our, our collective capacity to collaborate? Yeah, I mean, and I feel like it's, a, it's in our nature to do it. So I feel like we have to work kind of hard to prevent ourselves from succeeding. You know, we've got a lot of um, external forces uh, dictating how we respond. Mm -hmm. And from your work, because um, I know you've, you've actually done a lot around taking patterns in nature and applying them to organizational systems. What are you seeing that's, um, that's really useful and helpful that's, that's moving systems in the right direction? Yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're very aware now that um, you know, you can't tell people what to do and take, like, what's important to people. It's purpose. It's, it's, you know, meaningful work. It's working with people you like working with that you trust. And it's doing it in a way that you think is right, you know, and that's what the ants and the honeybees do. They're completely diverse and independent. You know, we have this idea of the clone army, but they are not. I think it comes down to the way we structure our organizations. You know, we work very well in small teams. And we work very well naturally in a team of teams. And that's how the social insects work as well. So I'm seeing that trend in organizations towards working that way, more of a team of teams and more intimate trust circles, and also the focus on shared purpose. You know, I think there is a real shift going on where companies are realizing we can't make people do things. We have to give them a purpose. We have to find the purpose that motivates them to, to work for themselves. So I, I do think we're on a, um, a shift. Are there some specific strategies that you can 
pull from nature to say, all right, if you're besides shared purpose, that's certainly one of the, it's, it's, it's where I start with, you know, if you don't know what you, why you're there, it's really hard to figure out what you're doing, but what else um, can you apply from your, your study of nature? Mm -hmm. um, well, definitely that shared purpose, but also um, the way, things that release our collective intelligence and swarm creativity. So that's, you know, enhancing our diversity and uniqueness and independence. Um, but then also facilitating consideration just so that we have more like consider there's other perspectives and there's other people who are experiencing things. And so I, I, I see that a lot of times we kind of come in with this top down, like looking at entities, looking at boxes, but in reality, life is a process, you know, it's flows. And so if we can work on those, developing those capabilities of understanding where things are coming from, where people are coming from and the history of the ideas and the history of their thinking, then you, that, that shared purpose is revealed. It also seems to me that a lot of, a lot of organizational theory uh, centers around control. And what you're talking about, it's not control. It's, it's, it's a, a way of organizing that is beyond any one individual's control. And so there's this leap of how do we create a system where we can trust that the mm -hmm. autonomous actors are actually going to be working in ways that benefit the whole system without us going in and saying, you over there, do this, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. And we're missing any kind of uh, real mechanisms for that. And we don't even really think about it. I mean, even, you know, like Facebook or something like that. It's just, you don't know who these people are. Um, it's a blah, but in, you know, the way that we evolve, we would be working with people we know and trust or people that somebody that we know and trust knows and trusts. So, um, you know, if we can get back to those kind of structures, uh, and, you know, in the, the um, like the ants, they work in these team of teams, it's partly because of things like, uh, well, parasites, but, um, you know, like a virus coming in, you know, they, they are designed to prevent that. So like the quarantine situation, you know, that you can see that, that it's almost like an algorithm that's been shaped to protect them from that. Mm -hmm. A lot of things we could learn there. What can we learn about trust from nature? It seems like such a huge thing for people, you know, is mm -hmm. there, are there ways to look at nature and say, here's what trust really looks like, or here's what something I can take and, and apply that to my life? Trust is very um, formulaic really in the biological world. Yeah. So one thing is they need to be able to trust each other, but that has a you know finite circles. So groups are small because of that. But then if you have language and reputations and names, you can expand that. Um, you could have that indirect reciprocity. So that, ex that increases our ability to work, but then like the social insects use this network reciprocity where they only allow people, well, ants that they trust in um, so that they can rest in trust you know, of everything. But however, the parasites are always trying to game the system by uh, imitating, you know, mimicking those um, signatures. So they're always trying to break in. So you have that password thing, but it's interesting because what the ants do is they don't use a linear password kind of thing. They use these complex like uh, scent, um, things like that, but they're, they're never wanted to be a perfect match. It should be uh, close so that you get the diversity, but still the trust. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, I think that we have not tapped into those deep patterns of trust, um, which are so well developed in other species. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've purposely ignored it, to be honest, because the parasites want us to be parasitized, you know, <laughs> it's designed that way. Oh. So, and in some cases, the parasites are remarkably effective. Oh yeah, parasitism is generally a winning strategy until the host gets wise. And the only way to get wise is through collective action. So, I mean, you see it and like chimpanzees are very dominant um, and they, you know, the, the, the dominant alpha just takes what he wants, but in like bonobo society, which are equal uh, re relatives, um, the males would like to, to take over, but they can't because two, any two females will ally together and shut it down. Mm -hmm. And so that's in our nature as well. And so that's another thing I take for organizations is this kind of, if you can work in trios in, in triads and, you know, suppress it, it's a, it's a distributed accountability system that allows us to um, take care of each other a little better. I love that. 
in your book, you point out that um, we are 98% chimpanzee, which means we're going to have Machiavellian politics. You know, there's going to be a lot of backstabbing or not. But that 2% hive mind, which is where all that collaboration comes from, are there some strategies you can talk about of when you find yourself in a situation where you're involved with Machiavellian politics, is there a way to up level and bring out from the other people? Let's move to super organism status. Let's stop stabbing each other back. Is there ways that, that we can apply that? Yeah, I mean, everything is like kind of by default set up in this uh, win-lose kind of dynamics, but if you can easily change that, um, you know, you can expand the shadow of the future so that you your shared purpose is more obvious and what do you, you mean by raise... shadow of the future talk about that well you know we have this uh the tragedy of the commons and the prisoner's dilemma and you know we say that uh, you know the temptation is to rat on your partner to throw them under the bus for your for yourself but in reality we play the game over and over again with the same individuals so if you can lengthen that shadow of the future the that you're going to be playing again that increases the um, the incentive for trust to grow. So that's one thing you can do. Uh, you can bring in that third individual that kind of holds that space. So you have a measure of fairness kind of built into it. Um, and and there you can always go, hey, you know, you you're talking a lot. You're you know using like you can kind of moderate each other in that way in a very low local level. Another thing that sticks in my mind from, I think it was actually one of your webinars, uh, is an image of how many uh, hours are spent in traffic just in the Netherlands versus <laughs> how many hours uh, spent in traffic leaf cutter ants were doing. <laughs> and so yeah. how do we wake that up in ourselves so uh, that we we are like, I sitting in traffic, I arrange my life never to sit in traffic if possible. But every time I'm in traffic, I'm like, this is a waste. There's millions of people sitting in traffic and it's just all going up in the atmosphere. How can we learn from leaf cutter ants ways of, of more effectively moving stuff around? Oh yeah, they're good at that. Um, and that's actually a really interesting thing. You know, like the superorganism colonies are limited by that distance to resources and yeah. living things don't scale up and up and up right they do it in cells and colonies and um, and that's why so uh yeah i think that we need to restructure the way that we live in in more um intimate uh, circles of trust yeah i think that would solve that and are there specific examples that we can draw upon that for the skeptics who say oh you know we have to be in control like Here's three examples from nature where nature has solved this problem. You know, I, I think we've both been on calls with Liz Satoris before, and she points out that bacteria solved all kinds of problems. They figured out how locomotion, sexual reproduction, how to use nuclear energy. You know, we're mostly bacteria. We, we think we're we're people, but we're actually bacteria moving around in the form of people. Are there some things you can you can think of for the skeptics to say? here's why this would work because it's based on a natural pattern and here's how it shows up in nature. And if you apply this to your organization, you will be in better shape. Well, I'm thinking right off the bat of uh, honeybees and the way that they choose a new home. Mm -hmm. so, Tell us about that. Yeah, so typically what they'll do is the most of the swarm waits on a branch, but the scouts who are the oldest grannies, um, they go out in different directions looking for suitable sites and they'll, you know, when they find one, they measure it and check it out to make sure it's good. And then they come back to the hive and they do, if they like it, they'll do a waggle dance, this little dance. And it tells the other bees what direction it is, how far it is and how good it is. Because if she likes it, she'll do more dances. So more bees see it and then they'll go, oh, I, I'll check that out. So they'll fly out to see it. And if they like it, they come back and do the same thing. So you get this like amplification of good sites and the poorer sites kind of dwindle away. And at some point there's a tipping point and the whole hive will go fly to that one. So it's it's not consensus. It's this kind of honest conversation of different possibilities that were collected in a diverse, independent manner. So uh, that and you know, God, if we could choose a president that way, it'd probably be a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a lot of listening going on, also. Yeah, and what's interesting too is they they don't share a site that they didn't go visit themselves there's no fake mm. news 
I also notice it's the grannies, it's the women. Maybe we need to have a lot more women in these positions of you That's know. That's right. And scouting absolutely. and. Yeah, it's really interesting that um, in, you know, ants, they start working in the nursery where they're born, but then gradually they work their way out and then end up outside. And so they're, they work their way up to the more dangerous jobs. So only the grandmothers, like the oldest ones fight the wars and the, yeah. So that seems like a, a good, a good way. I mean, you wouldn't want to waste your young on them. On that. Yeah. Wow, the thought of grandmothers fighting wars is kind of mind-boggling. <laughs> yeah, seems like it'd be a very different type of war. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was also going to say that the the grandmothers um, also do like the waste handling. So, like you know, you have Fukushima where you've got these elders that were so heroic that went in there, and that's just what you see in mm. super organisms. The role of grandmothers in um, expanding the range of options for human development. Uh, very unique in primate society. What, what does that teach us? What does that tell us? Yeah, it's really interesting. So um, one of the things about superorganisms is, you know, they they share, they they take on different roles. And so you get the um, only one female is uh, doing all the reproduction for the whole colony and the rest are sterile. So, you, you know, but what you see in humans and like orcas and elephants is you see this like prolonged post-reproductive life. Um, span for the grandmas, but also for, for men as well in our species. And so it, what it seems is that, you know, the defining characteristic for superorganisms is they don't do their own child care. They, they, uh, and so like for, for great apes, they do all their own child care, but for humans, we only do half of our own child care on average globally. So that's profound. Like that is the care that is the defining characteristic probably for mm -hmm. organisms. So what you see is these you know grandmothers. We depended on that shared childcare, and so we've selected for this prolonged um, post reproductive life uh, mm -hmm. because we just need each other. I think that's a great spot to um, end my questioning and open up to the folks to our to our studio audience. Um, remember, we all really need each other. So. Who's got a question you'd like to post to Tamsin? And I thank you. This has been very rich. Yeah, Stuart. <laughs> thank you. Um, so thank you for your 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 thoughts and your remarks and and your um, your observation of other species, Tamsin. The thing that that I'm noodling with as you're speaking is, and perhaps this is you know a way in which <laughs> we hold humanity. As, as a special species, but we have created all of this technology and infrastructure and tapped into some potentially pretty violent energies. So with all of your positive views, do you think that we're gonna and can see that kind of evolution that you talked about before the shit hits the fan in terms of climate? <laughs> In terms of, you know, in terms of climate change or, you know, capitalism going so amok that you know, people start to uh, end up in, in levels of violence that we can't imagine. Okay, I just want to say that the grandmothers are handling the shit. <laughs> And she did say that. <laughs> They're out there with their knitting needles. <laughs> yeah, Stuart. <laughs> so we don't have to worry, huh? Just talking about how the, right. there should be more listening on the part of the men. So, you know, like. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, it's really scary to see. And, and you know, it was, I was looking at the charts on climate change and, you know, where you hit a point where the oceans are not. Um, viable. And that's not as far away as we imagine, you know, I mean, that might be 2045. Uh, so there's that, there's a time factor here. I mean, if I was just to look at this stuff, I would say, well, that, that little human experiment went awry and that, that meaning capitalism and, and this real kind of parasitized societies that we have. But I do think that if given, if there was not the time problem, we could solve this because we would naturally revert to our na our nature. Um, unfortunately, there's a time problem. So, you know, I don't think the answers are going to be technological, probably. I think they're going to be organizational. But what I what I do believe is that we have all the things we need. 
you know, we did this for 5 million years. Like we, we can do this. Um, and what's amazing is you see how slowly human, um, technologies evolved. They're very slow. And, you know, it's not because people were stupid. It's because they suppressed it, you know? And so like when this like narcissism, runaway narcissism starts, you know, it's, it's linked. I mean, I tend to avoid thinking about problems because I pretend like I'm, you know, an animal, which I am. And I go through my little path and I look for what's um, potential. I'm looking for potential and I'm going that way and doubling down on what's working. So I'm not thinking about the world's problems. I'm thinking about what can I do to um, create abundance around me. So I think if we were all thinking that way, we would revert naturally to our superorganism state. And especially when we can't fly around and drive around anymore, you know, we'll probably start to uh, look around and see what we can eat. Beautiful. So just a, a, a quick follow-up question. In, in, the other, in other species that you've looked at um, that have kind of come up against kind of a, a wall that might be analogous to what we're facing as human species, have there been kind of mass die-offs or, or strange behavior that have happened in, in those instances? Yeah, I mean, that's the way that life always has been in these kind of, um, you know, you, you, let's say the trees evolve wood and nobody could digest that for a long time. So then you have these fossil fuels that, that accumulated from that, you know, until bacteria invented, like, oh, we can eat this. Um, so that process is always going on, you know, you get accumulations of waste and that becomes an opportunity at some point. And then those buildups are, um, kind of smoothed out in the flow of things. So yeah, there, there is that. And I, I take, what I take from that is that those accumulations of waste, those problems are actually opportunities. If we can, if we can figure out where the opportunity is. So uh, I think it's a, adjusting the way we think. So we just need to be thinking in archaeological times. <laughs> yeah, that, okay, that's where I uh, was on a, a webinar the other day. You know, I'm like, oh, I got all this solved, no problem. And then somebody said, yeah, but what about time? And then I'm like, oh, I've been on evolutionary time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Scale is not universal. <laughs> uh, I just want to throw something in from Sand Talk for those of you who've read Tyson Yocaporta's wonderful book, Sand Talk, How Indigenous Thinking Can Save the World. He mentions five different kinds of mind that mm -hmm. uh, indigenous people work with. And one of them is actually stepping outside of time and bringing together as many diverse perspectives as possible, solving the problem there, and then coming back and applying it in time. I know that sounds a little bit woo-woo, but it actually, to me, makes a lot of sense that, that we are capable of stepping outside of time in our minds and coming together and coming up with really innovative solutions and coming back and, and applying them. So I, I'm with you, Tamsin, although I'm dismayed by what I'm seeing, I'm also refusing to give up hope that we, we will we'll come out of this in a good way. Uh, Tasman, this has been so rich and wonderful and um, a lot to think about. And I really appreciate you coming on to share today. Um, yeah, uh, something was said earlier. I think it was actually Ken who mentioned it, but I'm curious if you could speak a little more about, um, I think you had talked about us being 98% chimpanzee and 2% other something. And there's a correlation, it sounds like, between um, Machiavellian uh, principles and ways of orchestrating um, societally. And I was curious, I've never heard that before. And I was just curious if you could talk a little more about that. Yeah, well, so um, like chimpanzees are, well, in, it, in most mammals, you know, the way that they solve their um, problems is just through dominance, like whoever's bigger takes it. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, it, it's actually a way to, it's actually not competition. It's just go the other way to reduce, you know, avoid competition is really what's going on there. So you get, you know, this correlation between brain size because you've got to invest in figuring out all the politics and, you know, keeping track of those, that trust, um, the reciprocity. But then, you know, when you get into the network reciprocity, then you don't have that anymore. And so you see the like social insects, their brains actually get smaller relative to solitary animals. So they, because they're distributing the costs, so everybody does better. But I think that we we kind of put this um, idea of us as just uh, 
smarter chimpanzees is, is very, um, you know, we hear about that a lot, but really we've got a very different social system. Awesome, yeah, thank you. That helps me understand. Uh, along those lines, Daniel Goleman um, actually posits in one of his books that the limbic system was invented uh, for tracking social structures and knowing, you know, who you had to uh, pay homage to and who you had to avoid and, and whatnot. So is it possible that, that we could maybe, um, without shrinking our brains too much, <laughs> that we could just grow our limbic system, our collective limbic systems for to handle networks? Because there's a big, you know, once we get past 150 people, that Dunbar number, you, you lose yeah. track of being able to, to do that. And yet here we are, 8 billion of us. So how do we, what's the way to create limbic resonance in networks? I think structure your networks to match your brain. Um, you know, this 8 billion people shopping at Walmart thing isn't going to, it just isn't the way that life works. So I think, you know, we, we go, oh, okay, we work best in groups of 150 and we work in these teams of three to five that we can intimately trust and know each other's strengths and, and weakness. You know, that's how we evolve. So I think if we can match that to our nature, then we can turn on the juice that we already have. And I don't think we're going to be shrinking our brains. I think we're going to have more surplus brain to put to work to make things better. I, I just see all the time that we just, you know, we have all these great ideas and these great inventions and brilliant people, but the, the lack of awareness of our fundamental nature, like as animals, how we actually work, it prevents us from doing anything with it. I mean, it's really unbelievable that we don't even understand what we are, that we have these kind of collective moral um, figures. And I think of them as like alpha chimps, you know, that we have by the same way that the bonobo females ally together to shut down um, dominance, you know, we do that too. We create these um, moral, you know, I think of them as schools of sardines imitating a bigger fish. Henry George founded the concept of commonwealth as a contributive process rather than an extractive process. Uh, I just want to ask if, because we're running out of time, oh, we've got yes, five more does. minutes, and I wanted to make sure that um, if there are other questions, but also if Tam Tamson wants to reply to any of that. Well, and that actually brings up something, because if you look at, you know, the general superorganism pattern, when a parasite comes in, um, the first thing they do is prevent the uh, collective intelligence. They suppress individuality. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, they actually, um, they interrupt that sharing and um, that trust. And then what happens is that the, they don't have the symbiotic relationships anymore. And so the waste builds up. And so then they poison themselves. And then, then nobody needs to have different jobs. Like that swarm creativity is worthless. Like you know, and so we end up competing for just to be the same, <laughs> you know, and then the parasite consumes everything and, and splits, goes to the next planet. You know, part of the, the end of the telescope that I'm most curious about is um, whether it's possible virally to re restore or revitalize the the hive vitality mm -hmm. um, by figuring out how to reawaken the internal mechanism, you know, of the individuals to their connection to everybody else. Because intrinsically, intrinsically, the severing of all those connections and ties is the parasite's victory. Exactly. If 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 the mass reconnect, yeah, the parasite doesn't have a. Pr it's sort of you know at that point the power is in the hands of the people. It's a it's a very <laughs> marginal strategy. Parasitism is a marginal strategy. Um, yeah, but and so like so that's what kind of how I'm approaching it is through these uh, rehumanized minds um, workshops where we focus on myths like living mythology that's from that place. It's a story that that you know really renews a people every generation, and so everybody's got their own stories. And of course, we now we've whitewashed it with a few, but they're still there, and those vestiges are still there. So 
you know, and, and we do have indigenous people that hold those fragments too. So I think, and we, can we go back to a time when animals talked, you know, in our myths and, and where we can regenerate that shared identity and the purpose and the human imagination that we all share. So it also takes it out of, um, it takes it out of religion, but it also takes it out of science. Yes. Mm -hmm. So now we're no longer doing logic. We're no longer doing exclusions. It's these deep patterns that, you know, people have been telling these stories for thousands of years. So they're true in some sense. And um, so I think that that's a very beautiful and enchanting kind of poetic human way of we're all connected to that, to regenerate our identities and our, and our, you know, individuality in it too, and get a sense of destiny too. Absolutely. Yeah, works for me. I love that we're ending on the ever-present return. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm a, you know, my last name's Homer. I have to have something about myth in my life. Right? <laughs> so, um, Tamson, this has been phenomenal. I really want to thank you for taking time to join us today, and thank everybody here for your attention and your questions. Um, now that you have been initiated, you are free to come back. You're welcome to come back, and you're welcome to actually interview anybody that you want. So if you say, hey, I've got some colleagues I'd like to talk to, please do that. We'd love to hear you, and um, hope you'll come back for some more of our conversations. Um, we're wrapped. We're at the top of the hour here. We can. Um, you want to stop recording and or keep going. We usually have a little after party for a few minutes if you want to hang out and talk more. Um, or if you need to go, that's totally fine too. I do, I do have another call. Okay. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure, you guys. Brilliant minds. Thank you. Yeah.